Good morning, welcome to Trinity Online. My name is Mackenzie and I'll be your host today. No matter where you are in your faith, we want to walk alongside you and we are so blessed to be joining you on your journey today. If you enjoyed today's worship video, don't forget to like, share, and subscribe to stay updated each week. And speaking of staying updated, I wanted to give you a few ways that you can stay connected here at Trinity before we hear today's message. First, let us know that you were here by checking in. You can scan the QR code on your screen or click the link in the description or in the chat below. Don't forget, you can dive deeper in today's sermon by checking out our worship guide that you can download on our website or also find in the link below or in the description. Have you ever wanted to see Jesus through the eyes of those who knew him? This Bible study is for you. Join us on Tuesday evenings beginning January 18th at 6 p.m. or Wednesday mornings beginning January 19th at 10 a.m. as we watch and discuss the television drama, The Chosen. In this first season, we'll see Jesus reach out to a fisherman struggling with debt, a troubled woman wrestling with demons, and more as he embarks on his ministry to change the world. You can contact Ms. Paula Roan for more details or to sign up today. Studying scripture is one of the most important ways we learn about God, and we are thrilled to present personal Bibles to each of our third grade students as a statement of their growing faith on Sunday, January 30th at our 945 service. We celebrate the tradition of presenting Bibles to our third grade students as a gift from the congregation. If your child's in the third grade and wants to participate in this awesome tradition, contact Paula Roan at the information below to sign up today. Speaking of Trinity Kids, all third through fifth graders are invited to attend our Trinity Kids annual winter retreat at Blue Lake Camp on February 4th through 6th. Children will play and learn and worship together as they go closer to God with campfires and just lots of fun. Registration is going on now and closes January 21st. Again, contact Ms. Paula Rohn for more details or to sign up your child today. Before we hear today's message, let's just quickly recap what we've learned so far in our known sermon series. In week one, we talked about the Enneagram type one and Paul the reformer. Now ones are conscientious, ethical, with a very strong sense of right and wrong. We saw this in Paul's story, but we also saw it was an act of God's love that transformed Paul from being a critic of the church to an apostle of grace. Last week, we learned about Enneagram type twos and the story of Martha. Now twos come not to be served, but to serve. And there's a big difference between the genuine desire to serve and being compelled to serve. Remember, we serve because we get to, not because we have to. Today we are learning about type threes and James. Now threes are self-assured, attractive, and charming. They're poised, but can be overly concerned with their image, their achievements, and how others think of them. Think of an unhealthy three as Gaston from Beauty and the Beast. We want to move from this vapid ideal of ourselves to seeing our true value and being at peace with who God has chosen us to be. And today we're gonna to learn more about that. Join me in prayer as we get ready to hear a message from Pastor Scott. Awesome God, we thank you for this amazing day and all these amazing people who are watching this video. We lift up any silent prayers or struggles or joys that they may be going through. We ask that you open our hearts and our minds to hear today's message and learn from it what you are calling us to learn. It is in Jesus' name we pray, amen. Nines are great listeners, great friends, great mediators, great spouses. They're very considerate of the perspectives of other people. Eights are not focused on control, they're focused on accomplishment. Not because we want to look good, but because we really want to fix broken things. Sevens bring joy to the world with their enthusiasm for everything that they're doing. Sixes work very hard to make the world a safer place. They're reliable, trustworthy, and compassionate planners. Fives are wonderful, brilliant people. They're great at analyzing data sets and making wise choices because all they want is to uncover the truth. Fours bring great value to the table as they understand God's uniqueness and they can see beauty in everything. They care about making a difference. Type threes are dynamos. They start businesses. They're always going, going, going. They're always working to win. Twos are amazing, wonderful people and uh, they're volunteering right now in the nursery. They're doing the jobs that no one else wants to do because they are selfless. And a one sees the world for what it could be. Ones are why the world is not falling apart right now. Ones are why our church has volunteers. They're why our church meets its budget. They're why we run on a schedule. They're why we have systems to keep it that way. Welcome. 
I'm Scott, the pastor of Trinity, and we're glad that you're joining us this morning for worship. We're preaching a sermon series called Known. The word comes from Psalm 139, verse one and two, where the psalmist says, O Lord, you have searched me and known me. You know when I sit down and when I rise up. You discern my thoughts from far away. We're talking about how God knows us intimately, knows us with our strengths, but also with our weaknesses. God knows our personalities because God made us. God made each of us in God's image, but God also made us all different. We reflect different aspects of God's image. We're looking at different characters in the Bible to see from them both their strengths and weaknesses and, and to see how God worked in their lives so that we can learn how God is working in our lives. Our goal is to know ourselves and know our neighbors better so that we can grow in love for ourselves and for our neighbors. That's why we're preaching this series, so that we will grow in love and empathy for those who think and act differently than we do. We're using a tool called the Enneagram. The Enneagram is a tool that's been used for a long time. It's a circle with nine points, and each of the points represents a different personality type. So far in this series, we talked about the type one personalities, the reformers, the idealists, and we talked about how the Apostle Paul is like them. And then the last sermon, we talked about the type two personalities, the givers, the helpers, the caretakers. And we talked about how Martha was one of them. Today, we're talking about type three on the Enneagram, the achievers, the role models, the, those who strive to succeed. We're going to look at James, James, son of Zebedee. James was one of the 12 whom Jesus chose to follow him. James and his younger brother John were in the fishing business when Jesus called them and they immediately left their boats with their father, Zebedee, and they followed Jesus. James was one of the core group, and both James and John, of Peter, James and John, the core group of three who Jesus particularly focused on, who joined Jesus when he went to the Transfiguration Mount when Jesus went to the Garden of Gethsemane. So James was a leader. And during their time with Jesus, during Jesus' journey towards Jerusalem, towards the cross, the following conversation takes place. I'm going to read to you from Mark's Gospel, chapter 10, beginning with verse 35 through 45. And in this section, Jesus has already taught James and John and the other disciples that he's going to be a Messiah who's going to give of himself, who's going to suffer and die and rise again. He's already taught them that the first will be last and the last will be first. He's already taught them that the greatest in the kingdom of heaven are those who are like a servant. And then the following conversation takes place. James and John, the sons of Zebedee, came forward to Jesus and said to him, Teacher, we want you to do for us whatever we ask of you. And Jesus said to them, What is it that you want me to do for you? And they said to him, Grant us to sit, one on your right hand and one at your left, in your glory. But Jesus said to them, You do not know what you are asking. Are you able to drink the cup that I drink, or to be baptized with the baptism with which I am baptized? They replied, We are able. Then Jesus said to them, The cup that I drink, you will drink. And with the baptism with which I am baptized, you will be baptized. But to sit at my right hand or at my left is not mine to grant, but it is for those for whom it has been prepared. When the ten heard this, they began to be angry with James and John. So Jesus called them and said to them, you know that among the Gentiles, those whom they recognize as their rulers lord it over them, and their great ones are tyrants over them. But it is not so among you. But whoever wishes to become great among you must be your servant, and whoever wishes to be first among you must be slave of all. For the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve and to give his life a ransom for many. Please pray with me. Holy Spirit, come upon all of us in all the places where we are. Guide me now to preach the words you want me to preach. And guide our listening so that we'll truly hear good news and know how you call us to live as followers of Jesus. It's in his name we pray. Amen. Here's my point. 
Jesus values us apart from our achievements. Therefore, we can be at peace with who we are instead of trying to show that we matter through what we do, what we accomplish, what we succeed at. My father received a Christmas card that I read to him and had a wonderful letter in it from a close friend of my father. And, and his friend wrote the following words that really struck me. His friend wrote, as miraculous as his birth was, it was Jesus's condescension that makes the incarnation so amazing to me. The extreme contrast between who he is as God and what he chose to become and experience as a human. And that word condescension, that really struck me because it condescended. To condescend means to choose to descend from superior rank or dignity, and, and that's what Jesus does. And being viewed with condescension, uh, being viewed as less than, that's what really uh, fills the anxiety of this type three personality, the, those we call achievers, those we call uh, the role models, those who really strive to succeed. Because these are the, the leaders in our culture. These are the, a lot of our prominent politicians, athletes, business leaders have this type of personality. They, they work hard to achieve good things. They, just, um, they accomplish a lot. They are diligent in what they do and they do what they do well and they help the world become a better place. It's, it's wonderful when people have this personality trait and Jesus had aspects of this personality because Jesus was someone who had vision. And Jesus did ministry well. Do you know people who are like this? Do you have this type of personality? Well, James also had this type of personality. The, the Bible really doesn't tell us much about James, so we have to search and we kind of look at some of the traditions that came later after Scripture. James, we do know that he came from a well-off family. I, I say this because the Bible tells us that they were in the fishing business with their father Zebedee. They had their own boat, which was a big deal back in those days. And they had uh, enough work so they had to hire people to help them. As I said, James had leadership skills. He became one of the core group of three that Jesus specifically focused on among the twelve. His family, James's family, they also had kind of a valued high status. They that had high ambitions for all their family. When Matthew, in his gospel, tells this story of when James and John approached Jesus asking to be at his left hand and right hand in, in his kingdom, Matthew says that it was their mother, their mother who approached Jesus on their behalf. That tells me that their mother has as much ambition as James and John did. You know that people can get their sense of self-worth from the achievements of their children, don't you? John, his younger brother, a chapter earlier in Mark's Gospel, tells a story of when John saw someone else who was not part of the Twelve, not someone who was part of what John felt was their elite group, someone different who was casting out demons in Jesus' name. And John was upset by that because you know, he was not part of their core group who we felt were the credentialed ones, the ones who Jesus gave the authority to do that to. And so John complained to Jesus about that and Jesus had to correct John by saying that this person was doing the right thing and they, they, they're on our side and not to view your place with me as something that's a privilege. It's the positions that Jesus gives are not for us to be above others but for us to serve others. James, the older brother, he asked Jesus with John, grant us to sit at your right hand and your left hand when you come into your glory. In the ancient world, people understood that the position of power was at the right side and left side of the king, kind of like being the chief of staff of the president nowadays or the secretary of state. They misunderstood Jesus' understanding of power because Jesus would demonstrate power for people rather than power over people. And the, the world tells us that glory comes from achieving things like winning an athletic event, like becoming national champions in football, being on that team, or by winning an Olympic medal. Or the world says that we achieve glory when we gain political office, the high office, or when we get our picture on the cover of a magazine like 
fast company. We gain glory when we win awards at banquets. And, and John, I mean, James and John, they were both still thinking of glory in these kind of terms. They thought Jesus was ushering an earthly kingdom, would overthrow the Romans, and they wanted to rule with Jesus. And Jesus had to correct their understanding because he didn't come to be served, but to serve and give his life as a ransom for many. And his glory would be not one of having power over others, but power for others. James had an ambition, and I want to be clear that ambition is a good thing. It's not a bad thing. It's because scientists had ambitions that were having, finding cures for cancer. It's because engineers had ambition that we were able to send a rocket to the moon and back. People with ambition accomplish great things. They lead us to accomplish great things. They help us as a church fulfill its mission. The problem comes with not with ambition, but it comes with why we do the things we do. Why do we want to achieve? Why do we want to succeed? Is it because we want to be excellent and do excellent things? Or do we do it because we want to show ourselves and others how important we are? Do we do it because we want to be viewed high in the view of other people? Do we do it to impress others? Tom Hanks, the actor, he once answered a question from a person about how to become a famous movie star. And Tom Hanks' answer was that uh, you know, we shouldn't you know, we should strive to be a good actor because acting is a craft. Acting is something you can learn, you can develop the skills that you'll become better at. But to become a movie star, to become famous, well, that's really something beyond our control. We, we, we can't control. We don't know what the public's going to want one moment, want the other moment, because people are fickle. I mean, if we're trying to impress other people with what we do, we're, we're just going to fall short because people are fickle. Emily Dickinson, she said, fame is a fickle food upon a shifting plate. It's, you can't make all the people happy all the time. It's, there's rally, sometimes you're going to fail. Pontius Pilate, the Roman governor who oversaw the crucifixion of Jesus, he also was a type 3 personality. And when Jesus was brought to him, Pilate knew that Jesus was innocent. But Pilate still chose to crucify Jesus to quiet down the, the crowd that wanted him crucified and to win favor with the emperor. Pilate, he, he tried hard to achieve, to win favor with the emperor, to be looked good by the emperor and, and the Roman leadership. Only in the end, a few years after Jesus' crucifixion, he was recalled to Rome and he was judged by Emperor T Tiberius and he lost all the power and priv privilege that he was struggling to attain. When we seek our validation from passing things of the world, we're going to be disappointed because the world can't deliver our ultimate validation. Our world can't ultimately affirm our importance because the world is fickle and because the things of the world will let us down. And only God, only God alone can validate us and, and affirm our eternal significance. James sought glory. And he thought glory would come from being at the right hand and left hand of Jesus. But we know from the end of Mark's Gospel that when Jesus is crucified, the one on his right hand and one on his left hand are two criminals who are crucified with Jesus. James sought glory, and we do know that he eventually will be glorified, but it'll be different in the way that James understood. Here's the Gospel proclamation. Jesus is glorified in the cross. That's when he is glorified. The Gospel of John, that's the whole theme of the Gospel of John, that when he is lifted up, when he is raised up, he will be glorified, and he was glorified when he was hanging on the cross because it's through the cross that we are forgiven all our faults. It's through our cross, through the cross, that we are affirmed that we matter to God. It is through the cross that God shows us that God is with us, even in our darkest moments, and suffers for us. It's through the cross that we are validated as important, not through our achievements, not through us trying to gain favor through doing things right and doing things well. It's, it's a gift that we receive that Christ gives us through his condescension, through his self-giving. And it's on the cross that his glory is fully and finally revealed. Why am I telling you this? Because I don't want you to seek your validation through the affirmation of people in this world. If, if you're one of those personalities that always feels that you have to succeed, that you have to be perfect, that you have to try to impress others, well, be at peace as who you are because you've already received validation. You've already been declared valuable 
by Jesus, you matter. He gave his life as a ransom for you, specifically you, for many, but also for you. And if you didn't matter, he would not have given his life as a ransom for you, but you do matter to him. And here's the thing, here's the, the, oh, the, the good news. Through the cross, Jesus freed James from his need to succeed. He freed James from his need to succeed, for his need to impress others. That's a good thing to have that type three personality to excel, but if we're doing it to impress others, you know, that can get stressful. Isn't it stressful to always try to impress others through what we do and be perfect? It, it can be burdensome to, to try to always win and never make mistakes. And what do we do when we fail? What do we do when we mess up? Well, we rely on God's grace. I wanna share with you a, a great prayer. It's a simple Psalm, Psalm 139, just three verses long, but this is a great Psalm for people with type three personality, the achievers, the role models. Psalm 131 says, O Lord, my heart is not lifted up. My eyes are not raised too high. I do not occupy myself with things too great and too marvelous for me, but I have calmed and quieted my soul like a weaned child with its mother. My soul is like the weaned child that is with me. O Israel, hope in the Lord from this time on and forevermore. What would it be like with those of us with this type three personality if we took this Psalm seriously and work to live out this Psalm? Because the Old Testament scholar, Alan Ross, he says that this Psalm tells us that genuine faith is demonstrated by a calm confidence in the Lord and not in self-sufficient ambition. What would it be like if we lived this out? How does it a healthy type three personality look like? How does it look like when we're living out this personality well in the way that God intends? Well, we can look at James. James ended up being glorified in the same way that Christ was glorified. He ended up following that path of suffering love. We know that James became a leader in the church. And we also know from Acts chapter 12, verse two, that James was the first of the 12, the first of the 12 apostles who was martyred because of his faith. James was killed by King Herod Agrippa I because of his faith in Jesus. It says that uh, he was literally beheaded because of his faith. Now, there's a story from the church historian, the ancient church historian Eusebius, and he shared a tradition that was going on in the early church about James. It's not in the Bible, but it's a, it's a traditional story that says that when James was brought to the court, of King Herod to be tried, uh, James had gave, put such an impression on the guard who was guarding him. The guard was so impressed by James's witness and faithfulness that the guard himself became a believer in Christ at that moment. On the spot, the, the guard himself professed faith in Jesus and then received James' forgiveness. James forgave the guard for being involved with this, and then the guard went with James and was beheaded with James because of his faith. Now, whether that's a true story or not, I don't know, but it tells me that in the early church, James was viewed as a role model. He was always viewed as a role model and as an exemplar of the Christian faith. That's the strength of this personality type, type three, the achiever succeeders, that they become role models for us and how we are to live. And it's just that when we have this personality, we need to realize that we don't need to succeed in order to gain favor. We don't have to impress others of the world in order to prove that we're worth something. We just need to receive the, the acceptance that Jesus already gives us. We just need to acknowledge that we're already, already valued immensely by Jesus and we don't have to struggle or try to achieve it through what we do. And, and then we use our gifts to be a blessing to this world. So if you have this personality type, then you're a blessing to this world. I'm grateful for you. I just ask that you realize you don't have to prove to me or to others or to God that you are valuable through what you do. Just accept that and show us how to be excellent in things. And if you don't have this personality, then, then have empathy and understanding of those who do. Thanks be to God. In the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen. Wow, Pastor Scott, thank you so much for that beautiful message. Thank you guys so much for joining us. Don't forget to check out our worship guide to dive deeper into today's message. And here's a little teaser for next week. 
Next week, we're gonna be talking about the Enneagram type four. Now they're the sensitive withdrawn type. And we'll learn what all that has to do with the biblical character, Joseph. See you guys next week. Thank you again so much.